It's wow. referred to as a lacerated eyeball. And I had 13 stitches on the white of my eye. Oh. One week before my wedding in South Africa, which also made it super cool for my wife. Hello and welcome to the Rugby Pass Offload with Max Leaf and Ryan Wilson, as always. Later on the show, we'll be joined by one of the most decorated players in the history of the game in ex-England and Lions Centre, Brad Barrett. Firstly, uh, some good news on the field. It's been a while, mostly Whoa. because of Max, but <laughs> you're both Whoa. victorious in Europe over the weekend. Sadly, we've got some bad news. Ryan, you seem to injure yourself in that win over Bath. So let's start with that, actually. What, 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 what's happened, Wills? I've hurt my knee. I've hurt my bloody knee, boys. Well, I I went for a scan just now. I've just been in the uh, in the MRI scanner, so we'll find out more. But I'm pretty sure from doing it a few times, I've torn my MCL. How long is that normally for you? I'm calling it eight weeks. I'm going eight oh, weeks. Calm. Enjoy Christmas. Saddle up. Your wife's gonna have to do everything with the kiddies because you've got no leg. <laughs> Some might say I did this on purpose. <laughs> just, previously, Ryan's just in the changing room slamming his door, slamming his leg in a door. How good. Yeah. Tactical. Tactical. Um, ah, boys, I tell you what, fucking hurt. If you watch the game back, I have a good old... It's because it was... Oh, really? Crock roll. You know what? It serves me right. I, I, do you know what I did? Do you know what Wait, I did? Were you jackling and then you got crock roll? <laughs> Went for a fucking jackal. What an oh, idiot. Wow. Idiot. You don't, you don't have the facilities for that, big man. No. No. Oh, honestly. Do you know what? And I lay there on my face. After I did it, rock like it fucking... I heard it. I felt it go and I heard it go. <laughs> and I lay there for all of probably five seconds. But I reckon I had about two weeks worth of thoughts go through my head. Like, why did you just jackal? How long are you going to be injured for? Do you reckon this is you done forever in rugby? Like, do you know what I mean? Oh, like, God. It like, got weird. Yeah. It got weird. I like it. And, and the next thing I look up and I'm like, please tell me the game stopped. And it's not. We've got like two minutes to go. We're winning. So then I do the only thing that a brave warrior would do. And I get back to my feet and I hobble around. Mate, the hair's out. I'm like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> Freedom! Mate, I look like Frank from um, what's it called? Shameless. I'm like stumbling round. I look like some piss bloke that's managed to climb onto the field. I'm more of a hindrance to my team than a help. But we've managed to do the job and beat Bath down at the wreck. And do you know what makes it that little bit more sweet, Max? It's all the so called supporters that are giving us, oh, throwing out a bomb squad. They obviously don't care about their, they'll never win. Yeah, well, go and eat your humble pie, you fuckers, because we did the job, didn't we? And I've gone back on Twitter and I've looked for you lot that were slagging us off about, you know, <coughs> we're never going to win. And there's some that have been quite good about it. They've gone and said, oh, humble pie eating, you know, didn't think we could do it. But then there's a few of you and I will find you. And I will <laughs> maybe name and shame you next week. Let's see if you don't go back out there and say, yeah, fair play, boys. But some of them, you know, that's... You love it, don't you? You love that that drama, don't you? You just want to be amongst the social media comment section and just swim in it. Yeah, I do, but I I think you should you should sort of stand by your comments and then go, wow, well done, boys, you proved us wrong, which a few of them have done, but there's a few of them that are snaked out of it. And one bloke just... slagged me off in my DMs and said, um, "Oh, poor from you to not come and uh, say thanks to the fans afterwards." I've pretty much been carried off the field. I've told me MCL. I can't walk. And he's slagging me off. He's DM'd you. <laughs> he's slagging me off. He's slagging me off. So he, he said, yeah, from you to not come over. And I put, come where? And he's put, oh, over to us in the stands after the game. I was like, sorry, mate, told me MCL. And he was like, oh, all right, that's all right then. I was like, oh, thank you. I'm excused. <laughs> oh, wow. Unbelievable. <laughs> It was weird though, Max. Like, I don't want to go on about it too much, but three guys debut, beat Bath down at the wreck. Like, everyone's obviously buzzing, but I'm sat there, knee in absolute agony. So I've sort of put myself in a corner. I felt, yeah, it was quite a sad time. I'm torn my MCL. I'm like, oh, how long is this going to be for? You know, you don't know if it's just MCL. Could it be ACL? Could this be longer? Could this be me done? Oh, and then there's boys celebrating their first cap, you know? So you don't want to 
dampen the mood. So and you were just melancholic in the corner, but trying a, trying to put on a front for the for the the greenhorns. So it's tough. It's, yeah, so it's that's sport. professional sport right there, isn't it? Jeez, professional sport, mate. Oh. Professional sport. So right there. Max, you helped Bristol get back to winning ways with a 19-5 victory away at Perpignan. How was your French escapade on and off the pitch? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so everything was going swimmingly. In the first 20 minutes, we're all over them. Just first phase tries galore. It was delightful. Mr. Semi Randarandara was on flames all game. Um, and then and then we sort of got dragged into the mire, so to speak, and it became a, a slugfest with a big French pack in in Perpignan, but we we browned it out. We got it done. But mate, also Henry Tuilangi's son is eighty. He's just turned eighteen, right? He comes off the bench. Position, mate, uh, back rower, monster, straight monster. Must be one hundred and forty clicks. Moves very nicely. And then I met um, I met the Simone Boogeyman himself at the at the Apre. Lovely guy. What a bloke. Ginormous still though. But yeah, he exists. The butcher is is a real thing. I thought he was a mythological creature. So did you get a night out in Perpignan? Oh, absolutely. We got to sample the Gaulish, Basquish yumminess oh. of the culture. Yeah, bar culture everywhere. Fumé. Just smell the fine cigarette smoke. <laughs> That's how you know you're in France. Though. <laughs> Just it's everywhere. You can't see past it. Derry's left, right and rhubarb. Um, got to reunite with Will Whitty, the new Perpignan signing. Lovely Yorkshire man. Great, great lad. He was telling me about his time there now from Chiefs and the culture difference. Obviously, it's a little bit more laid back than the extra Chiefs, extra Chiefs way. But yeah, it was mate, his class. Um, saw Brad Shields. He got we- at, at the wee wee hours of the morning. He was he was pr- essentially quite weird and all in all, just a wonderful European away, like a real throwback. You know, we were lamenting it. Oh, it was it was just nice to have. It was nice to have. Staying in France. Um... Rogs La Rochelle started off the defence of their title by destroying Northampton Saints 46-12. Uh, La Rochelle, patchy in the top 14. They've lost three out of the last five. Bloody hell, they, they show up in Europe, don't they? Blimey. 32-0 at half-time. At 50 minutes, it was 46-0. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what was going wrong for Saints. But really, all the big top players for La Rochelle just turned up and were blockbusting, weren't they? They were out of control. Skeleton was shredding every single more line out that existed. Bogoritz was so industrious, mate was out of control. And um Dante was just yeah, slamming, slamming first phase. He was all over it. That bump he put on uh, on Louis was not 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 one for the highlight reel. But yeah, man, they were they were class, weren't they? A, a team that's doing fabulously well, Leinster, totally smoking racing, really. Uh, I mean, right, how how t- terrifyingly good are they at the moment they can go there to Paris and do that they were looking well oiled though weren't they James though outstanding <laughs> Josh van der Fleer like oops, just tearing up um, they were bloody good Leinster and they've, we've been talking about them it's interesting to see them go up against Rassin Rassin obviously weren't great were they um, I just think they couldn't deal with that that breakdown speed was nutty mate and the minute it got part outside a few phases, you just see the big fellas were gassed. Like those rats and boys were blowing. And um, Leinster loved like multi-phase attack. And the more they got into that matrix of theirs, the, the more lost the rats and boys looked. It just it just accumulated, didn't it? Ten metres out, they go so different to what you see any premiership team do. They they hit it up and then the next one's the quick one, eh? Where they just mm-hmm. that's how they're scoring tries. They just yeah. pick it right off the back of that, quick rucks. Whereas you see most teams get to slow it down, get two or three people in there, whereas they're, they're quick to get around that corner. But yeah, they were on fire. They were on fire. They're, we saying they're favourites? I reckon, I reckon it's pretty safe to say they're favourites now. Yeah. Let's continue our whistle-stop tour of the weekend's pan-continental competition. Uh, the two Prem clubs in Sale and Saracens uh, getting off to winning ways. Sarri's coming from behind to beat Edinburgh. That that's a heck of a performance though from your local rivals. There you say it, right? No. Nah, Sarri just didn't Sarri just didn't play very well. Man, I was so surprised. I was shocked. I was like, what's going on here, lads? Are you about to get turned over by Edinburgh at home? But yeah, they got it done in the end, but it was ugly. 
I think they'll be upset with themselves. They probably should have won it, shouldn't they? They had Damien Holland had that break where he got absolutely hunted down. Yeah, I think they'll be kicking themselves. They had a few few moments in the game where they probably let themselves down a bit. But Saris weren't great. They weren't great, and that's how the best sides do it. They just cling in there and, and manage to scrape them out, and that's what they did. Yeah, that's what's about. That's what's about. Boys, Sale Sharks blowing Ulster away. Incredibly dominant uh, performance. Thirty nine 0 victory at the AJ Bell. I did not see we'll that. touch upon the game, but but just quickly, you know, Ulster could only fly to the match on Saturday morning due to bad weather. You know, how big of a deal is that? You're literally unfolding yourself from cattle class. Those tall fellas, the long johns and that Ulster pack, are unfolding themselves, just peeling themselves out of the seat. And then they've got a clang clash horns of the, the Dupree twins and the rest of them. No, nah, I don't I don't I think that's tough. That's a that's a that's not an ideal preparation. It is not ideal. You're right. But I'd say it's significant. what's the longest bus journey you do on a game day? Three hours max, bruv. Yeah, okay. Do you know how long the flight is from Belfast to Manchester? 30 Less. minutes. 30, 30 minutes. minutes. You're literally up and down. It's nothing. That is not an excuse. Okay, I take, I, obviously, I'm, not, I'm not taking that in. I've not taken that in. 30-minute 30, 30 little charter flight straight out of Belfast because obviously Belfast to Glasgow is like yeah, 20. How do they get spanked so hard by sale? They sh- look, that is a good team. It's, they sh- they've, let them, they've, let them, they've let it get in their minds. Oh, really? They've let it get in their minds. So it's psychosomatically, not- they've fucked themselves. Yeah, I think I so. I like it. How have they... Like, that is That is, that is massive, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I'll make out a Northern Ireland alive this week. Yeah. Uh, that's big. I mean, I've been coached by Dan McFarland and I would not want to see him. He, he, yeah, it's going to be some spank bottoms this weekend. But, oh, no. <laughs> Certainly some spanked bottoms. Yeah. <laughs> I'm mean, fucking raging. Furious, yeah. That's, yeah. No, there's no excuse. That was just terrible. 39-0. The main talking point probably wasn't sales dominance, but Manny Tuilagi's uh, concussion we had head-to-head collision uh, with Andy Warwick, seeing how strict the officials are nowadays with those head collisions. Are we a little bit surprised it wasn't red? A man who's gone, in, he's gone hard. He's going hard. When you're going to bump someone, what do you do? What, what, what's the body position you usually take? You're coming, you're coming down. Leaning forward. Drop, you're like upper body into your hip and like, synchronize that weight going forward to like especially man who's very good at it awesome timing really powerful athlete Warwick's a short man very yeah short man like tiny I'd say well how tall do you reckon he is he is not tall he's not above four foot five <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he's, no, uh, he's not relative know, to the middle. I don't know if he's that short, but he's short. Okay, right. So I'm t- we're building the picture here. Okay. But the minute I saw it, I was like, he's going to get red. He is going to get redded. But when the more I looked at it, I was like, oh, oh this is tough. Because Warwick's not really making an action, is he? He's sort of like, he's just there. Whereas Manu's the one who's sort of gone in with the collision. He's sort of enacted the hit. If if anything, and that's I what my, that that would be my that's my sort of um, my issue with it. Like the uh, the ball carrier has to um, also take care of himself as well, doesn't he? Oh uh, yeah, I don't I don't think it's a red. Like Warwick's barely even going for it. Yeah, I, I agree it's with you. Warwick's waiting to absorb one. the shot of Manitoulin and he he gets head by. So you send me next week. I go to play Bristol and we go fuck. Tell you what, that run run run. He's a good player. Wilson, get the ball and run and try and headbutt him, and he's going to get red carded. <laughs> That's how it's working at the moment. I'm going to run, you, and as I get near you, I'm just going to stick the nut on you and go, oh, you fucking, you headbutted me. No, it's not how it works. It's not a red card. And get rid of crock rolls as well, because my knee's fucking killing me. <laughs> was, was there a body that jammed your knee in when you got rolled? Uh, there was yeah, there was someone down there, someone oh, down there. God, that's awful. Well, um, speaking of not, not someone down there, but something down there. Uh, let's talk about yeah. See what I've done yeah, with that. Talking about down there. Let's <laughs> down there let's and an unkept bush, and 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 going native. Uh, we're delighted to be partnering with Manscaped again. 
to bring our listeners an incredible deal in the run-up to Christmas where we're offering the best present in the world by giving you a 20% and free delivery on all Manscaped products with the code RUGBYPASS. All you have to do is go to manscaped.com, put in that code, trust me, or trust Ryan probably, your balls, and anyone with access to them will thank you. I'm uh, that was someone's tried to use that in my well, house but... since I've been here. <laughs> the the deodorizer. So I'm guessing one of the kids is Frank. trying to mess around with Jax is probably trying to use it as hair gel for school, bless him. Um Max. <laughs> yes. Max, how are you how on the manscaped, how are you kept down there? Pretty tidy, nice and neat? Oh yeah, I'm I'm manicured, old being. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I think we should do a section on this. I'll trim my pubes into whatever shape Manscape want, as long as I can get their new, their new set. Like, surely we're going to get a, a new Manscaped trimming set from this. Yes, uh, Mark. Straight the ball fro, gentlemen. Mark, you you good down there? Don't just say it to like join in with the crew. This is about you know individuality. Here. No, no, I I I I'd be I'm I would love a free platinum package 4.0 from Manscaped to really sort of you know you know, you know too much about you need, the do you, need, do you need it at the moment. Look, there's nothing in my entire like face or anything, but down there, just it's it's wild. So I'm like, let's get let's 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 bring Christmas cheer to my wife. Like the jungles of Jumanji, yeah. Well, there you have it. There you have it. There's the scoop. Maybe me and Max won't get it because we're well trimmed and you're going to get the kit because you need it more yeah. than us. But I'm telling you, oh, yeah, I want to know. Thrilled that my parents listen to this, particularly my mom. She'll be. <laughs> so. Well, we are delighted to now be joined by a man who's won five Prem titles, three European Cups, 26 England Caps, and of course has toured with the British and Irish Lions. Uh, to finish off the sort of European rugby chat and, of course, celebrate his wonderful career. Brad, welcome on the pod. How's it going, sir? Very well, Mark. Thank you for having me. Where, whereabouts are you at the moment? I'm in Cape Town, uh, South Africa. So in slightly better weather conditions than you are at the moment. Uh, so going into that summer holiday vacation period here, which is fantastic. We've got Brad here. Let's crack straight into some of the rugby over the weekend. The Arguably the biggest highlight the introduction of the South African sides for the first time uh, in history to the um, European uh, competition. A decision uh, which has split players, Brad and fans alike. Uh, but what a spectacle uh, the Sharks and Harlequins put on uh, for us in Durban. We had nine tries, a red card, and the Sharks uh, just holding on 39 at 31. Brad, we can't help but be entertained by that. Yeah, I think uh, obviously the South African teams have come in with a, a bit of controversy. Um, I think we must all be honest of the state of where rugby's been. Uh, I think in the last 18 months, we've seen two premiership clubs go bust. I think we need to draw more people in. Uh, South Africa is one of the highest viewing populations of rugby in the world. So I think we've got to be honest around those bigger sporting and rugby markets coming together to create a super sort of product. Uh, there's no mistaking there's some super quality teams in South Africa. I think two of the three in their first rounds of uh, European rugby have won, uh, which is a good indication that they're only going to strengthen as time goes on. But yeah, I think it's a strange one, for, even for people in South Africa. They're not used to seeing rugby being played in December times, um, especially in places like Durban, 100% humidity, high 30s. It's usually like a, a piece of soap playing rugby at that time of year. But I think, uh, line, yeah. yeah, also, you can't go to the beach to cool down either at this stage. So uh, I think, all in all, I think they will raise the, the level of rugby. I think uh, there's some great teams, as I mentioned. Um, but we've got to give it a few years. I think it's never going to be the finished article from round one. I think as time goes on, teams will really enjoy coming out to South Africa. And particularly, I think, fans, if you talk about a, a minus 10 degree, if you see one of your team's out in South Africa in December time in European rugby, you may choose an early holiday to go support them. So still early days. Let's see where it goes. I, I By the way, I agree with you on that. I reckon it's it's weirder for the fans. Like the fans are going, this is a bit strange, but as a player, you can't be complaining. Like I think as a player, it's an amazing thing. I do agree. I think it's weird. They've got to rename it or something. It can't be called the <laughs> European <laughs> Cup anymore. Yeah. It is strange. But yeah. as a player, as a player... Getting the chance to go over to South Africa and play and seeing the likes of who did Leon played against Bulls at the weekend over there. You see Harlequins go up against the Sharks. I think it's really cool. I think it's a good, I think it's a great thing for rugby. 
it is a bit strange. Well, I think it's been a great addition to the URC. Uh, you've obviously played in it for years, Ryan, but you know, I think the South Africans' addition has just raised that level, and you're starting to see those URC URC teams actually outperforming a lot of the Premier League. And, and it's a reason for a holiday, isn't it? I mean, not for the players, of course. We're not on holiday. Yeah. Well, we yeah. <laughs> look at the Dragons. Dragons ended up out there for three weeks. They played two games in the URC back to back, and then obviously had their game out there at the moment. So they had three weeks out in South Africa. How <clears throat> you gotta love it. I'm, you got I'm it. very jealous of that, actually. Yeah. Is that your same sentiment around the Six Nations as well? I don't think so. I think it still works quite well in terms of uh, South African rugby pairing with New Zealand and Australia. I think it quite makes the autumn series quite exciting when those Southern Hemisphere nations play against Northern Hemisphere nations. I think if South Africa are included in the Six Nations going forward, it takes away that prestige of the autumn series and also takes away from the the World Cup spectacle of those teams coming together in a sort of one-off hit. So I'm not in favour of that in terms of them joining the Six Nations. I'm glad we're aligned. So we're all with it. We're all... We're He's nailed it. He's nailed it. Europe, European yeah, but hang Cup, on. But... We're going to call it. Let's... But yeah, Six Nations, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, sort of speaking around Six Nations, particularly England, you know, your old teammate, Owen Farrell, came out over the weekend and said that he's... Uh, unbelievably disappointed that Eddie Jones has been fired and that, that it wasn't player led. You know what? What was your reaction to the firing? Well, I think we're in the results business, um, and you know England. I think with the resources and player pool, I think if everyone's honest, they've probably underperformed. Um, and every coach, unfortunately, gets held to that account. Um, hard to say, obviously, not part of that squad and not part of that setup. But, you know, I think on, on the flip side, there will also be a lot of English players super excited because a lot of players in the last two years have been written off, whether it's been form permitting, they've not really had a look in. And that's, you know, certainly down to one man's opinion. So you can get a sense that maybe in English rugby, the wider player group will be quite excited about a fresh face coming in, um, the slate being wiped clean and then being able to put their best foot forward for selection for Six Nations time. From your perspective, as you know, Mr. Saracens and, and the captain of the team, when you had someone like Alex Zazowski, right, right, great player coming back and having effectively been, you know, horrifically treated really by Eddie Jones, how, you know, how do you pick? How do you pick up those pieces? Yeah, I mean, every player goes through it at some point. Um, it does instill some resilience, uh, I guess. On the flip side, when you're constantly knocking at the door and no one's answering, that's probably when players get a little bit despondent and feel like they've fallen out of the system. Um, so hopefully moving forward, a lot of those players, you know, you mentioned Alex, another guy, Ben Earl, who you know has been on fire for Saracens this season, and he's not even included in a sort of wider 40-man squad. It just begs you to believe, you know, what's happened, what's gone on behind the scenes. So again, uh, I, I don't want to really speak about what's happened. It's probably more forward thinking and that a lot of players across the English game will be excited about fresh ideas and a new perspective on who's going to get selected. I suppose another way to look at that as well, which we didn't speak about last week, those guys that are in every week and that are really comfortable suddenly are put on their toes and they've got to then perform a little bit better to make sure that they're seen in the right light by the new coach coming in. So it's not only the guys out of the picture, it's the guys in the picture that are suddenly like, shit, I better buck up my ideas here if I want to stay playing for England. That that can, yeah. that can have a big impact as well, eh? Yeah, I agree with you completely, Ryan. It's, it's now... Uh, a a fresh canvas. I mean, even uh, talking in Saracen's context, a guy like Elliot Daly has fallen out of the picture. Uh, he has a blinder yesterday. I think, you know, Edinburgh were fantastic and actually pushed Saracen's super close. And had it not been for a few little bits there and there, they, they could well have walked away with that. But Elliot was outstanding um, in that game. How slow did he make Damien Hoyland look? <laughs> yeah, and I probably that's not a, not an indication on on Damien. It's probably more how quick Elliot is, especially but, on that curve, right? He moves. You're looking at it, think, what is he? Doing? Damien Hoyland, come on, mate, speed up, and he's going at full pelt. <laughs> <laughs> mate, Elliot Daly, absolutely flying. Yeah, he's rapid though. Yeah, Brad, from your perspective, you you were a central part of of uh, Lancaster's England side for four years, and then it seems to be sort of quite cruelly dropped by Eddie Jones never to play international rugby again? What, what, what actually happened between the two of you? It's a very good question. I, I'm still wondering that myself, Mark. Um, you know, I, I guess it is what it is. Things don't fall your way. But um, 
arguably in my mind the sort of 2015 2016 season as a Saracens team uh you know double winners both premiership Heineken Cup I was probably playing as well as I'd ever play and other than one phone call on the first selection meeting saying you're not part of it this time um I never heard from again so it's not really um everyone's cup of tea in terms of how coaches communicate but I think sometimes in these circumstances the more players are communicated with the more they feel that they're part of the wider process so I think if we look at the likes of Alex um, Ben Earl even an Elliot um, and countless other players from other clubs they also get a sense of excitement you know six months out now from a World Cup uh, the doors well and truly open for anyone to perform on the big stage. But right, just quickly going back to what you said, like how often have you guys been in situations where, you know, it, it, it makes logical sense that somebody would be speaking to the coach being like, he's having an absolute blinder. You know, why aren't we getting him involved more often? I mean, surely those conversations happen, don't they? I guess it's different though, isn't it? International rugby and, and club rugby. I can like, I imagine the way that I've obviously heard things from guys that I've played with at Sarri says... The England camp compared to what the what the environment's like at Sarries, polar opposites, I imagine the the way that yeah, it's I guess the, the the challenge with England, you know, in terms of compared to other nations, you talk about Scotland and Wales, um, you know, you're not having to get two or three or four clubs in together, be part of a team and move forward. Ultimately, there's usually twelve in a Premiership and. Trying to get that level of sort of buying and everyone on the same page from minute one can be quite a challenge. I mean, Brad, who are you, in, with that in mind, who are you sticking in there? Who's who's going to take up uh, the challenge of of remoulding this England side and turning them to world pitches again? Well, I, I think you can only go by where all the Chinese whispers are. And I think Steve Borthwick seems to be the name that's most aligned to become the England coach. Um Again, can only speak on my experience. Was a fantastic captain, um, super uh, super role model, um, a guy who didn't leave any stone unturned, and in his short coaching career has been outstanding too. Um, has both international and club experience. You know, took a really underperforming team from Leicester in two years to a, a Premiership title. So. Again, it, it's it's all it's all to come. I know it's not completely out there. Um, it could be someone else, but that's the only name I've heard. Unless you guys can tell me otherwise. I heard there was some kind of uh, drama with like how much Leicester want for him in terms of the staff. Because obviously, yes, yeah, so, but Steve, Steve uh, Borfwick wants to bring over like all his support guys, and then Leicester, oh, the big, some big cheddar. And apparently, it's 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 making stuff a little bit difficult. Yeah. Well, you can't really begrudge them for that, right? I mean, no, they've, absolutely. Yeah. They've put it together a team. Um, feel <clears> like they're in a good place. An England coach loses his job, and then they get the rug pulled from under them. So, I think they stand within their right to make sure they get what they need out of it to to get replacements. Um, but ultimately, I don't think any club's going to stand in the way of someone who they respect and someone who's done so much for them because. No one wants someone to stay on at a place where his mind has already moved on. Do you reckon Eddie Jones had a desk of some like form? What do you mean? <laughs> well, like, do you reckon? You would imagine so. You would, would imagine have had so. a desk somewhere in maybe Twickenham or something. Because all I can imagine is Cockerell being given the interim role in, and going straight to that desk, feet up on the desk, like, this is my fucking desk now. I can just imagine him. I can just imagine him in there. You know, like, there yeah. must have been a desk that Eddie Jones had. Like, did he have to go in and get get his stuff like out and empty out? A Penny Hill. Well, it would more like likely be a Penny Hill. Yeah. Yeah. More... The big dog suite. The governor's yes. book. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Do you reckon there's there's a couple little perks which Cockerell's a, a like special locker in the spa and things like that? Yeah. I'm I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I reckon I reckon Cockerell's in there now, right now. Right now, like... showering, singing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, essentially speaking, of course, in the short term, he is in charge. From your perspective, how terrifying a prospect is that for the England players? I can only go off what I've heard, and that's from the boys that played under him at, uh, at Edinburgh. And he's, uh, by all accounts from them, he's not really someone you want to be playing under. 
That's all. I, I mean, yeah, they didn't enjoy him. They didn't enjoy him. Yes, you can only say super successful at his tenure under the Leicester, um, under the Leicester badge. But yeah, I haven't heard much. Uh, maybe that was an Edinburgh thing. And you know, yeah. coaches do evolve. They have bad patches and they have periods in their career where they lose their minds a little bit. I think maybe that was his. He got it wrong with Edinburgh. I think the way they're like people, aren't they? Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah but you know, rugby's evolved as well. Like how how much does that form of of coaching really work at club level do we think these days is is that what players sure, not in this, no not in this day and age no oh, here we go here old we go play. the old victim mentality is that what you're coming to yeah oh, oh they don't make them like they used to do they right a club they've got to sustain that for you know what's it 42 weeks a year international mm. you get you know those three blocks of five to six weeks where Players can tolerate being put on on, on edge, um, you know, being treated yeah. mean, keeping them keen. Uh, you know, what is it? The more you're feeling uncomfortable, the more comfortable you'll be. Uh, that sort of mentality. I think when you put that into a club environment, it just becomes white noise. Hell's it good. becomes, you know, it yeah. goes one in one in in one a and out the other. So, yeah, I think someone can be super successful at international level and it doesn't necessarily translate to the club environment because that's about consistency, about players being part of something bigger and being able to sort of get something out of each day, week in and week out. You can't squeeze that in a three to four week period. Yeah. And, there's a and lot, think- yeah. Now, around the club level, there's a lot more of a family feel. Whereas when you go to international sort of get parks then it because you don't really integrate a huge amount with people's families and close ones so club is family international is a bit more ruthless yeah That's let's just clo- close the loop a little bit on the uh, on that you know there are whispers the aru the australian rugby union are are doing everything they can to take get eddie jones on board uh, for the world cup you know, is, is this a good move from 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 the aru I'm not sure. Like, I, f- I kind of like where Rennie's going at the moment. Um, and then, obviously, Rennie would never anticipated someone like that being an overseer. So that'll throw the cat amongst the pigeons, potentially. I don't know how that'll work. So if he comes in, um, will they? Will there be chemistry there? Or will, there, will they butt heads? I mean... Those, these are the questions that need to be asked. But as 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 sort of his political as his political his um, intellectual property goes, yeah, I mean he he'd, he'd give a lot back to Australia. I think especially now with what he knows. But um, what do you reckon, right? Do you reckon that would that would work? I don't think they get on. Yeah, I don't. There it I is. See, I can't see Eddie Jones after the game. Renz has got the gat out, singing a few songs, and Eddie getting in the middle with a little jig. I just can't see it. <laughs> That's what I'm going on. He's quite a good I don't think there, it, isn't he, off the field? I don't know. I, no, probably. He's probably not. Well, Brad, let's take a look at your incredible career, you know, starting off your school days at Kersney College, where it's fair to say you owe your life to Matt Stevens. Tell us what happened all those years ago. God, he loves the story. I've never seen a bloke sort of play on it more than him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I it is a true it. story. I haven't heard it. I have no idea. It's a, it's a true story. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, everyone at school has their summer and winter sports. South Africa, I was rugby in the winter, cricket in the summer. And for some reason, I ended up sort of walking past the pool. And uh, I think they were one short for a water polo game. I'd never played water polo. It was a pretty average summer at the best of the time. So, you know, did what every sort of keen kid did and said, yeah, sure, I'll jump in. Um, we're playing against some some school and sort of bobbing in the water, trying to, you know, mark the man as you do in water polo. And a guy sort of turns around and has a shot. And his whole hand follows through, wax me square, in the nose, finger in the eye, full on concussion. I sort of slowly fade off to the bottom of the pool and no one actually noticed. And Matt was an innocent bystander at the pool and he jumped in and pulled me off the bottom of the pool. What was, what, was, what was he doing there? Was he was he at school with you or something? Or was he just sort of yeah, running he's... around the swimming pools in the <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't remember. He might have played a game before. So he was a few years older. So either he was playing the game after um, and I just super perceptive and, and saw me there. So, yeah, 
I do owe my life to Matt in a very strange way. <laughs> when, when he dragged you out, I'm, what, does he have to like resuscitate you or something? Or you... <laughs> no, I remember sort of, sort of unconsciously sort of waking up and coughing, but the bigger risk was my eye. So I got rushed off to A&E and still to this day, I've got like a watermark over my um, retina because the, the damage to my eye was pretty extensive. So I was in a sort of dark room for three weeks allowing my eyeball to recuperate oh, only to be wow. injured by Owen Farrell about 10 years later playing for England where I had the same eyeball poked out and that one required stitches to the actual eyeball stitches on your eyeball <laughs> or on yes. the actual... <laughs> so it's it's wow. referred to as a lacerated eyeball and i had 13 stitches on the white of my eye oh. Ah. One week before my wedding in South Africa, which also made it super cool for my wife. <laughs> I'm guessing that's not one of the ones you come straight off the field and they do it there and then. <laughs> no, that one was also <laughs> done by a, a more more of a specialist. It's not your uh, run of the mill doctor who operates on eyes these days. <laughs> Bloody hell, that's mental. But that was actually so England toured South Africa in 2012, um, and it was my return to my hometown stadium in Durban. And it was about 30 minutes into the game. I was pretty sure one of the South Africans were going to try it first. But it turns out Owen and I tried to tackle the same guy and his arm sort of wrapped around and went straight into my eye. Oh, yeah, fucker. Yeah. So. Cheers, Faz. <laughs> you played alongside uh, Fran- Francois Steen and Butch James. Uh, for yeah. Sharks straight out of school. You know, how incredible... And uh, and perhaps terrifying equal measures was was that in 06. Yeah, I think when you think back to it at the time, you don't really look too deeply, but I was probably fortunate. I think a lot of guys can probably stand account in that my first year out of school, the Sharks um, organization had their worst super rugby of all time. So I think there was a max exodus of both players and also staff. Coach got moved on. And as a result, Dick Mio, who was the coach at the time, came in and decided we're going to back some of the kids. And that included myself and Waylon Murray, who was the outside center, Francois Stay, JP Peterson. And uh, yeah, we went on a sort of amazing sort of three years, culminating in a, a home final in Super Rugby against the Bulls, only for Brian Habana to break everyone's heart in the 84th minute after a knock on and score. <laughs> So let's just talk about all the good news stories. Thank you very much. <laughs> and anyway, going back actually, to eyeball. Um... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, Brad, you know, obviously that heartbreaking Super Rugby final loss, by it was just a point, right, if, if I recall. Uh, where, where does that rank in terms of, of bad memories and, and missed opportunities for you? It's still the hardest one, if I'm brutally honest. I don't think I slept for two weeks on I literally wake up just going, Jesus, I can't believe that actually happened. You know, it was probably the the best time of for South African rugby, you know, 2007. You know, there was unbelievable players, the unbelievable depth. It was the first time two South African teams had been in a final. We topped the log. Um, we'd beaten sort of big Kiwi teams away. Um, and everything was sort of building up to this amazing crescendo. And... Uh, it just wasn't the fairy tale to be, and everyone was left feeling pretty empty for a long, long, long time. Butch came on the show and said, effectively, it was one of his worst memories as well. So yeah, uh, again, I had, I had on similar own. ones. I'd say the good thing is it did prepare me for other ones to come, because I think if you have it all your way <laughs> in the beginning, it makes the the heartache further on down the line pretty difficult. You know, we had it at Saracens too, um, twenty thirteen. We lost back to back finals. And that was long before we'd ever won really anything. We won the Premiership in 2011, but, but we lost to um, Toulon at the Millennium Stadium for the Champions Cup. And then the following week, lost to Northampton at, at the Premiership Finals. And then the day after, we flew to New Zealand with the England squad with uh, the Northampton players who were planning their bus parade and what watches they were getting and wearing the medals. So <laughs> it really went salt into the wounds. When you actually left South Africa at the time for Saris, it was a relatively odd move. And as far as uh, they weren't the team that they are now at, uh, at the time, had, yeah. at that point though, Brad, had you had you given up any hope of playing uh, for 
you know, your mother country in the spring box, you know, because actually I think you, within a year, you were playing for the England Saxons. So Saracens at the time, if I'm honest, was a bit of a disaster. Um, Eddie Jones, ironically enough, was the one who signed me to Saracens and I arrived sort of end of November. Eddie was only there sort of two and a half months and the thing looked like it was going to implode. So for a very brief moment, it looked like one of the worst decisions I'd ever made. Um, at the beginning or maybe a couple of weeks before the end of season, Brendan Fenter took over. He effectively moved 23 players on, I think, we were looking around in the changing room of the last couple of weeks, and I think I was one of 13 players that were due to arrive for preseason. So it was a really unstable, really strange time, to be honest. Um, but it did make sort of the journey beyond that even more rewarding because it was sort of built brick by brick. It wasn't the Saracens that you see now, the, the machine. There was some really tough and arduous periods over that sort of next two to three years to get back to the levels where we, we thought the team deserved to be. On the South African front, um, if I'm honest, I only saw it as a two-year hiatus. Um, I played South African schools. I played South Africa under 21. I played emerging Springboks in the 2006 season. And I always knew that there was an opportunity to play for England. Um, my mom's side are all English grandparents or English so there'd always been a strong affiliation uh, all my cousins lived in England I don't really have any extended family here in South Africa so there was always a strong connection to England but I didn't really go with a plan so to speak um, that first season sort of went well there was an approach from England at the time and I thought to myself if this is the place you're going to be um, you need to decide either way and at that point I sort of committed for England. So it's still a very proud moment when you were picked, obviously, for England, but also that at the start of your career, then getting that call for, for the England Saxons, that, that, was, that, that was a proud moment for you. Yeah, I think at that point in time, I'd sort of recommitted to staying on at Saracens and had made the decision that's where my future lay and I had enjoyed it, especially being a sort of new experience for me. I, I'd grown up in Durban. Um, you think that you're at the epicenter of the world and you realize it's a very small fishbowl in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so I think the exposure to being in London in terms of a really sort of world-class city and everything that was supporting around it, I was able to do a master's over my time at Saracens. Um, it gave me a much better grounding and made it, me a lot more worldly, um, having only lived in Durban prior to that. Uh, Brad, do you, what do you miss most about... Um... Being in, living in living in London and English culture then? The spontaneity of being able to do things in London and within a heartbeat be in the West End or, you know, be on the King's Road or being in Hampstead in a lovely restaurant. Um, those sort of elements to day-to-day -day life. I think also a special thing with London is that anyone gets away with doing with whatever they want. Um, I think maybe guys in Bath, or Bristol probably struggle, but the anonymity of being in London, being out um, was super appealing and super exciting. Um, having grown up in the fishbowl of Durban, it was certainly a breath of fresh air. Um, beyond that, I think the rugby side don't necessarily miss the physical act of rugby, but I guess what I have learned, what was super cool, and I think probably people in rugby take for granted, is actually starting a project on a Monday being able to have a conclusion and a result at the end of the week and be able to start a project again on the Monday. Um, you know, having that feedback loop of being able to say, uh, you know, we, we put in this amount of work and having a result and starting again. I think in the business world, um, I'm working in fintech now, the, the sales cycles are a lot more arduous and a lot more long-winded and often I sort of look back on a Friday and say, am I closer to my goal than I was on a Monday? And oftentimes I feel like I'm not and I've taken a few steps sideways or a few steps back. So um, the bits of rugby, I guess, that I do miss are, are that, is having a group of like-minded people around you day in and day out, which is which is pretty special. Um, I think looking back on it, you, you do take it for granted when you've been around for too long. So enjoy it while you can, gents. Why did you not stay in rugby? I just felt like I, I needed to do something new. Um, I'd pretty much gone directly from school into professional rugby setup. I mean, probably much like you guys too. Um, I just felt that I needed to test myself in a new industry. Um, 
needed that reassurance that you are not just Brad, the rugby player, that there are other strings to your bow and you can be successful in something new and adapt. So it wasn't a case of closing the book on rugby forever, but I think at this point in time, I, I needed a new challenge and I needed a new a new vehicle to try challenge myself. In your in your new job right now, Brad, do you get imposter syndrome? I I, I think I'm just beyond that, but for the first oh, right. six, <laughs> six, <laughs> the first six months. Thanks it for was bringing it back, one. though. Thanks. Yeah, I was googling acronyms literally every five minutes because a guy would just drop in. Because again, I, I I had done a little bit in tech, but not on the level of tech that I have now found myself in. So. Yeah. You know, just nodding and pretending like you know exactly what the guy's talking about. But now I've learned to, you know, once you learn that sort of surface level, high level jargon, people okay. sort of respect that you know what you're talking about. You famously refused general anaesthetic in 2018 when you required surgery on your on your cheek so you could play uh, in the European Champions Cup quarter final against Leicester. Uh, take us through that injury because surely nothing compares to that afterwards. It probably wasn't nearly the most stupid thing I've done, ironically enough. It was quite an innocuous injury. I didn't actually know I had it. Um, I caught a stray elbow the week before. Sorry, the, the the evening of the game and went home and I blew my nose. And as I blew my nose, my whole cheek sort of puffed up um, as if I'd eaten a toxic lobster with a, a bad allergy. Um, sort of phoned the doctor and he said, oh, shit, you, you probably fractured your cheekbone. So it wasn't super painful in any way. Um, but then I think the, the Saracens medical team knew this really cowboy maxiofacial surgeon who said that he had a way of making sure that it would be stronger than ever and you didn't have to go into general. So I got wheeled off to some random hospital in the middle of Surrey. I actually don't know what it was. It was probably some day clinic. And uh, basically had to open my mouth and he went through my mouth as if you're having a tooth pulled. And sort of did an incision on the inside and was able to screw in the plate from the inside of the cheek. Right. Yeah. I think usually when you have, um, I guess, facial surgery, they'd always put you under general general anesthetic. But they said the the lag period, you know, if you've had general, you yeah. feel off for three, four days at least. So it was sort of accounting for that. Um, so it was just more the weirdness of a guy sort of holding these plates yeah. and going in through your cheek. It wasn't cool. nearly the most painful thing. Plus, yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? Though, like, and it hurts a lot more. What what I always struggle with is seeing the match, and you split yourself open, you're straight in, and you there's no time for local anaesthetic a. Eh? So yeah, they stitch up. It in. actually doesn't hurt that much. It's afterwards when you have to, and they're like, we've got to finish this off, and they're like, do you want the local? And you're like, oh no, it didn't hurt that much, and you're like, fuck yeah, hold on a minute, what is that? It's the amazing what adrenaline can do on the pit. I can't imagine. Yeah. I'm not sure about yeah. just wandering down to a clinic and getting someone to open me up from the inside whilst I'm awake. That's, uh, that's a bit far-fetched. And, and then what we have to look forward to is at the age of 40, having baggy eyelids like an 80-year-old, where your eyes are closed when they're actually open. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. Tell me about it. It's oh, true. Stupid, <laughs> things. stupid things we do for the Let's... Um, Quickly, a few a few last things, Brad, before we let you go. We know we've uh, taken a lot of your time. But um, 2013 came the greatest honour in a rugby player's life when you got called up to tour with the British and Irish Lions. But how did the uh, call-up come around in the first place? Yeah, as, as every player was included in that wider group, you got a letter that you're being considered for selection and you're all excited. I think it was the week before um, the final selection. We had the European Cup game. I had a really bad injury, effectively sort of didn't play for the rest of the season. Um, so the week after the injury happened, sort of didn't make the initial squad, um, decide, you know, I'm going to make the most of the summer, uh, decide we're going to go on a trip around America, started in Vegas, went to San Francisco, went to... LA, then to San Diego. Um, and the culmination was coming back to Vegas for three days. So I've done pretty much most of the trip. Um, and there were a few of the boys out there at the time and sort of late night. And I remember getting back to my room in the early hours and there's a voicemail from Andy Farrell. 
It's like, Brad, we've been trying to call you all day. Um, we out here in Australia, we're going to call you up to the Lion Strip. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this. So within the blink of an eye, I'm on a plane to Australia, straight from Vegas. Um, and the rest is history. So, How long uh, have you been on the piss for? Well, I, if I'm honest, I, I, I'd had little periods of doing it. So I had a few good days in Vegas and then had traveled around. In the back of my mind, I did have this sort of inkling that said, yes, you would be part of the team that, you know, if something happens, we would call on you. So I had stayed semi sort of engaged in terms of a little bit of training, beautiful gyms out there at the wind um, overlooking sort of the, the strip. So I hadn't sort of disengaged from it completely, but by the final trip, we'd come back. It had been sort of back-to-back days. And I thought at that point, the, the dream was over. But when things are least expected, that's often when they come. <laughs> couple of highlights from that trip to Australia once once you sort of sh- shook off the, ha- the hangover you know apparently it was the last great Lions tour in terms of off-field activities yeah I think you know I, I make no bones about it I was by no by no means the most integral part of the success of playing in Australia but I think just being part of the whole um you know, prestige of being part of that Lions trip, seeing what goes on behind the scenes. And I think it is truly one of those sort of special tours where people come together like they never do, right? Very rarely in a sort of test match environment, even the premiership games, different countries and teams be able to sort of mix and be a lot more inclusive. So it was a throwback to the original days of players going out on a Tuesday night, having a good fun, training hard, the guys who are not included on the weekend, made sure they sort of spun it up in Australia on the weekend. Um, and just a really cool atmosphere to be part of. Um, and then particularly, I think the last 10 days, effectively the last midweek game was played, I think, the week of the first test. So effectively, there were about 15 to 18 guys who were two and a half weeks knowing they don't have another game unless, heaven forbid, someone get injured. So <laughs> we we had a great time. There was actually a brief moment, I think, on the eve of the the first test. Jonathan Davis had quite a bad injury. And I, sort of out of obscurity, had played quite well in the Melbourne Rebels game and got told he's a doubt and went to the captain's run, literally not knowing any of the calls, saying potentially playing tomorrow. So there was a brief moment of, oh, geez, what have I done? I might have enjoyed myself a little bit too much, but uh, sanity prevailed and he was okay. But again, would have would have loved the opportunity to have played in one of the tests, but it wasn't to be. All right, Brad, let's finish up on uh, our quick fire rounds. First thing that comes into your mind, best player you've ever played against? Uh, Tana Umaga. Best player you've ever played with? Depends on what, how you define it. Uh, Tony Brown was the first fly half I ever played with. Um, he was the former All Black and Highlanders fly and he was amazing. I mean, I just remember at the time, he's now obviously coaching Japan, but he was someone that sort of blew me away at that age, you know, just his technical skill. I've never seen a bloke pass like that um, ever since. Biggest fight you've witnessed in training? Might have been Glenn Jackson and a guy called Tom Ryder at Saracens. Maybe I was ago. just about to say Tom Ryder will be involved in it. I'm sure. I'm sure it was him. I may have got my wires crossed, but that's the one I do remember. <laughs> he loved the scrap, old Tinchy yeah. Ryder. Yeah. <laughs> he was in Glasgow for a while. Tom Ryder is a good bloke. Fucking love that guy, but he, he did like a scrap. Yeah, but back in the early days, it, it happened a lot more, right? It was just sort of the done thing. There would be a few punches thrown. I think. You know, that was sort of 2005, 2006, 2007. I mean, that was back in the day where we were on a VHS watching games after the game. Um, yeah. So times have changed. So things have hardened up a bit. That's just what you did if you were a second row. You just had a fight at training. Yeah, right? pretty much, yeah. Boys, right? <laughs> you obviously tra- travelled with club, country, lines. Worst roommate? Alex Good. Why? Why? <laughs> I, I just remember this one, um, this one uh, Saxon's trip, and I still can't. And I, we we good friends, and I often ask him about it. What was your thought process? I remember he had a bag of Haribo, and he's just munching along. I'm like, can I, can I have one, please? He's like, no, mate. I was like, and I was like, expecting the laugh. I'm no, no, I'm joking. He says, no, no, don't share sweets. And that was just the end of conversation. 
<laughs> we had like an, an awkward standoff for another four days. And worst enemy in rugby? I don't really have enemies in rugby. I think, you know, often with rugby, you have this perception of someone that you play against. And then you either a team or meet him off the pitch and he actually couldn't be further from the truth in terms of actually how he is. And it's it's often the guys that you think are not your cup of tea that you actually meet and they're probably more your cup of tea than you ever anticipated. So, you know, another good example is that I remember actually Lee Dixon at Northampton used to irritate us. And then you end up playing with him in an England environment and he's one of the nicest fellows around. So it's he's amazing, what, like your perception yeah. of like how annoying someone can be and how they rub you up the wrong way, and that just then be competitive. And he's been mentioned in this, he gets mentioned quite a lot. Yeah, he's so been mentioned yeah. a few times. Yeah, was, you know what? You, with, he was one of those when uh, there's an advantage for a penalty, the fake tap and go. I just can't. Oh, <laughs> the fake tap and goers. <laughs> the fake tap and go. Just, I can't have <laughs> And if you whack him. If you whack yeah. them, you get in trouble as well. So it's just a lose lose, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Uh, three, three people in a cab with you for the biggest party of your lives. Probably go with probably three of my best mates from my time at Saris um, Chris Wiles, uh, Hayden Smith, and the last one probably being Alistair Hargreaves. Wolfpack Lager. Wolfpack Lager, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out for the I'm boys. Li- Sandy, that's all the time we've got left uh, for this week. Huge thank you to Brad for coming on and uh, talking us through his fabulous career. And thanks to Max and Ryan, as always. And thank you all for listening and watching. See you soon. Bye. See you next week. Cheers, guys.